very good evening to all of you welcome to the webinar on role of emergency department accreditation and improving quality i am dr sarvano kumar the national president for society for emergency medicine india and on behalf of sebi and yashoda hospitals and the organizing team for today's webinar dr navin and dr shrina i welcome you all to this wonderful event today we have a very important faculty among us dr bk rana is the current director and ceo of quality accreditation institution he was the former ceo of nabh and quality council of india he was the former chairman of asian society for quality in healthcare which is aswa the former president of international society for quality in healthcare is co and founding member of international academy of quality and safety and he represents many quality boards across the globe namely isqa the relationship between semi and quality accreditation institute not many of you may be aware since last few years we been working very very closely to promote awareness on ed accreditation and also we have worked together to come out with the emergency department quality standards many of our semi colleagues sit on the technical committee and these standards are drafted to suit our indian emergency medicine departments i am happy to share currently closer to five institutions are already accredited i know dr mehtas cmc vellu apollo hyderabad apollo drdo and apollo secunderabad and i am sure there are few more on the line and these are uh, the new set of standards for emergency departments in india today's discussion from dr rana is going to be about how accreditation in emergency departments helps in pro quality but before we move on to dr rana i just wanted to share a couple of statistics which i managed to gather from across the globe in emergency departments friends many of us think we do a great wonderful clinical job in ed which is true and we also assume that our ed is the most safest place for our emergency patients which is unfortunately not true let me tell you about some of those statistics from developed world 7% of any ed patients have some sort of an actual or near miss 12% of emergency department revisits are due to an adverse event two thirds of errors in er happens due to a system issue at least 60% of our ed patients experience some sort of a near miss 76% of our ed patients get a written diagnosis at discharge that means only at least 25% of them don't have a clear written discharge instructions 65% of those information is incomplete among those who get those discharge sheets and an average verbal communication between a doctor and patient is only about 76 seconds 29% of doctors reported adverse events or near miss due to poor handoff practices and only about 34% of our ed patients get any sort of an instruction on when and how to return back to ed this is quite staggering and when in a developed system report such an errors i'm pretty sure we have either same or perhaps even more such errors happening in our eds so how do we make our emergency departments patient friendly and also safe for our patients this is what we are going to listen today from dr b k rana sir thank you once again for joining us today among your busy schedule please enlighten all of us so that like we all can get into this quality journey of making our emergency departments safe thank you okay thank you thank you dr savana thank you very much uh, for the background and and quite interesting statistics uh, which really makes all of us to think that how much we have to work to improve these statistics in terms of saving lives of people uh, for several reasons uh, you know they are coming to hospitals emergency department and we really work hard and make sure that they remain safe and they get better care so there's the agenda at around the world when everyone is trying to move towards quality and safety journey so thank you so much for wonderful statistics and thanks to uh, uh, this webinar uh, the host uh, the, the sudha group of hospitals and sami 
I see NY also uh, over there. So thank you all for uh, inviting us QAI as a partner, which definitely we are proud of partnering with SEMI in the journey towards quality and safety in emergency departments. Um, thank to Srinath, Dr. Srinath uh, for, you know, channelizing all these things and, and all the team members of uh, the organizations to make this happen. So thank you once again. And uh, now we, uh, without putting much time around, I would like to uh, move forward and I'm just sharing my screen. Uh, okay. So is my slide up at your screens? Yes, sir. Thank you so much. So role of accreditation in improving uh, quality and safety in emergency department. And as we all know that the emergency department is one of the most important uh, department or area of a hospital where the patient landed first, you know. Any emergency, the patient landing into the emergency department. So it's very important for the people working in the department to really understand the patient's problem and quickly, uh, you know, uh, find out what's the problem and where they need to send this patient, whether they need to keep in the emergency department or send it back, send it to other department where the person need to be, be undergo the treatment. So identifying the, the reason and the problems and then referring to uh, within the department, very, very important. And that's why the role of standards are very, very crucial. And accreditation, of course, is a great driver, a great driver for change, change for the betterment, to improve quality and patient safety. And therefore, uh, this seminar is very timely and we should be discussing about, you know, the role of standards, the role of accreditation in improving quality and safety. So a little bit about QAI, uh, Quality and Accreditation Institute, uh, with a you know, tagline of change, adapt, improve. So we strongly believe that to make any improvement, we need to change. And that change need to be adapted. They need to be practiced yes. over a period of time. So first you change, then you use that change, practice that change, either policy, a procedure, or a process. Whatever you made changes in need to be practiced, need to be implemented over a period of time, which certainly will help you in improvement. Uh, we started in August 2017, so fairly young organization, but. Uh, even we have worked very hard and we can say with, with the data that we are the fastest developing accreditation body around the world, which is based on that in less than five years of operations, we have developed 15 sets of standards for accreditation. Uh, we have set our vision, uh, which is to nurture the largest global pool of organization and people through a improvement and quality and accreditation framework. We, we want to achieve our vision through our mission, which is to conceive and deliver education, training, accreditation and related programs in partnership with the stakeholders using an approach of co-design and co-creation. And this partnership with SEMI uh, is definitely an example of moving towards our mission. We have our values, which want to be great listener, want to be competitive, transparent in our operations, and we want to be innovative to look for different opportunities for further improvement. This is our organogram. We have four verticals, Center for Education Training, Center for Accreditation of Health and Social Care, Center for Laboratory Accreditation, Center for Accreditation of Veterinary Facilities. So in Center of CET, we do a lot of educational and training programs related to standards for accreditation, as well as some general trainings and um, educational programs. In veterinary, this is a, again a very unique and new program. There is no standard for accreditation for veterinary hospitals and clinic in India, and for that matter, in many countries around the world. So we set this up for the first time. The standards have already been developed, tested, and have been you know, uh, supported by uh, Department of Animal Husbandry and Dairying, uh, Government of India. Then we have Center for Laboratory Accreditation, uh, which offers four pro accreditation program program for medical lab accreditation as per ISO 15189. All these are based on international standards for ISO, where most of the accreditation bodies use these standards. Uh, most of you may be knowing about NABL accreditation. So we are similar to NABL accreditation. We follow the same standards, and that's why we are at par with NABL and any other accreditation body around the world. We also offer testing laboratory accreditation as per 17025. 
calibration laboratory as per 17025 and a new program for biobanking accreditation as per ISO 20387. QI is the first accreditation body to start um, biobanking accreditation in India for the first time. And we are the third accreditation body in the whole of Asia Pacific after US and China, uh, one of A2LA in the US and CNAS in China uh, to start this program. Very unique is standard publics in 2018. We have already accredited one biobank in the government uh, sector, which is National Liver Disease Biobank in Delhi. We are as signatory to Asia Pacific Accreditation Cooperation APAC for our testing and medical laboratory accreditation program since October 2022. We are also a signatory and full member of International Laboratory Accreditation Cooperation ILAC uh, for testing and ma medical lab effective December 2022. This recognition makes it equivalent and par at par with any accreditation body, not only nationally with NABL, but internationally anywhere in the world. So the test reports generated by our accredited laboratories are accepted globally. Under her, uh, Center for Accreditation of Health and Social Care, CHSC program, we have 15 programs at the moment, as I mentioned to you in the beginning. This is our menu card. We, we, we covered end-to-end -end solution for patients, patient journey, uh, is starting from a clinic uh, to a polyclinic, to a dispensary, to ambulatory care, uh, daycare surgery procedure or an, an imaging center or a laboratory to a hospital, tertiary care hospital. And then if you're not in a hospital, then you're going moving to home. And if you need anything at home, we have an aggression program for home care. And then we have a program for transition care. If you are not at home, you're not in a hospital, but you are in a transition care after uh, discharging from hospital to receive a uh, post of care. So we have a standard for Transition care. You can be anywhere and receive uh, health care. We have a telehealth accreditation program as well. So it's, we cover end to end, as I mentioned. And we are very unique in many programs like home care is the first time in India. Uh, globally, we were the first uh, home health care uh, accreditation provider in the world based on internationally uh, recognized standard of ISCOA. And then we have IVF, we have, you know, a telehealth accreditation program, which is now gaining momentum. And of course, emergency department. The latest program, which we launched uh, just, just now is primary and is advanced stroke center accreditation program, which is a, uh, based on excellence in stroke care, based on clinical protocols and outcomes uh, to, demo, dem, to be demonstrated by a hospital. So this program is really, and like emergency department supported by SEMI, the stroke program is, is supported by Indian Stroke Association, ISA. And we are really getting a very good response from many accredited hospitals to apply for a stroke center accreditation program. Uh, th this is just a statistics, a uh, number of accreditation, though very, very few, but we are happy uh, with the way we have started. Uh, the most successful program is IVF. Uh, we have 41 uh, IVF center. Most of them are from Indra IVF group. They are the largest player in the world. Uh, in, in, yes, I think they have 110 centers uh, in India, so making them the largest uh, the, uh, IVF provider. And we have accredited 38 of their center. Then we have Apollo Fertility and Oasis Fertility and uh, Guardia Hospital Fertility Center accredited. In home healthcare also, we cover almost the largest player of the country who cover more than 90% of home care services, Apollo Home Care, Max Home Care, Portia Medical, Antara Home Care, mm -hmm. and so on. And then dialysis, patient safety, ambulatory, telehealth, and the telehealth one first client was in Dubai, in, in a hospital in Dubai. And then second is Practo. Practo is the largest telehealth provider in India. They are accredited by us. And of course, emergency, uh, Dr. Sarna's hospital, uh, the Mehta's hospital in Chennai was the first, then CMC Valor, and now we have four hospitals from Apollo Group accredited by us in emergency department. And of course, transition care, first two already accredited, Subitas, SCS, Subitas, and Uchwas in Hyderabad. This is structures how we are growing, uh, and we are growing in numbers as, as, as year passed. So, uh, as you can see, the trend in the second slide, in the second half of the slide, is growing, and we expect to touch uh, close to uh, 80 or 90 this year. Uh, as I mentioned already, uh, we are uh, created by ISCO as an organization, and we are the first accreditation body in India achieving. ISCO accreditation in less than five years of operations. 
our hospital uh, ho home care standards and dialysis standard by accredited by ISCOA. Our hospital standards are accredited by ISCOA. So making us the first and only accreditation body in India. No other accreditation body have achieved this much of what we have achieved in the last five years. And our accreditation program for hospitals, uh, dental centers, eye centers, and imaging centers is approved by Ministry of Health for CGHS and Penalment as equivalent to NABH accreditation. Uh, we are institutional member of ISCOA and board member of International Society for Telemedicine and eHealth. We publish a journal, International Journal, QI Journal for Patient Safety and Quality. It's an international journal published two times a year online, no charges for author to publish, no charges for accessing, it's free online accessible. So if you, are, if you want to publish something what you're doing in ED for quality and patient safety, you may like to consider this uh, journal for publication. This is our gold seal, mark of sustained quality. Uh, after accreditation, an organization become entitled to use these in their their materials, letter heads, visiting cards, and and and, and, the, and the brochures and and the, and the boards, etc. As I mentioned, an emergency department accreditation of our client, Dr. Mehta's Hospital, uh, CMC Vellore, one of the largest uh, hospital in the country, and then four hospitals of uh, Apollo Group, DRDO, Hyderabad, Sikandrabad, and Jubilee Hills. Benefits of accreditation, of course, very important uh, is to ensure quality and safety in care, ensuring trust, privacy, and confidentiality and uniformity of care across uh, the, the, the department. is helped in standardization across the department and services. It also provides an opportunity for benchmarking amongst accredited organizations, enables the organizations to demonstrate commitment to quality of care, and helps raising community confidence in the services offered by the organization. So it helps a community to, uh, to recognize you, to get more confidence in your services when they see there is a third party who, who have recognized your organization for emergency department. Helps improve overall professional development of uh, doctors, nursing, and paramedical staff. It also helps in building national and international recognition because you uh, yourself distinguish from non-accredited organizations. It supports sustainable business practices and accreditation stimulates continual improvement journey in emergency department. So it's not a static process. It keeps asking uh, people working in the department to keep improve, improving their processes and outcomes. Now about the standards uh, for emergency department. As I mentioned that these standards were thoroughly de developed using a process we have a standard development process of ISQA, which we follow, which comprise of drafting the standard by technical experts, the committees, then public stakeholder consultation, then pilot testing, and then, then rolling it out. So thanks to uh, Sami and their, 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 the governing board members for supporting it, uh, part of the technical committee. And so this standard is comprised of 10 chapters in all, which has been divided, which have been divided into 62 standards which are further divided into 245 criteria. So standards and criteria are basically to be measured. A standard is a statement that defines that the structures and processes that must be substantially in place in an organization to enhance the quality of care. So it's a, it's a statement of compliance for different areas in a, in a specific service or a department. And the criteria within the organ within the standard is a measurable component of the standard. You can really measure it, and by measuring criteria uh, within a set of standard, then you comply with the standard, and then complying with sets of standards, you comply with the entire chapter, and then all chapters together comply with the entire standard. So, if you look this uh, look at this table, it's, it's covers the framework of the standards. So, there are ten chapters. I can see that one to 10 divided into a number of standards uh, in each chapter, and then each standard then further divided into number of criteria. So in all 10 chapters, 62 uh, standards, and then 245 criteria. So it may happen that uh, the first one standard may have two, three or four uh, criteria, and some other may have six or seven. So it's it may vary, but in all, uh, they should be looking at and complying to a specific. So for example, uh, if you look at this structure chapters, uh, it covers everything of the organization. It starts from the governance and leadership, the management uh, on a top, and then it talks about the facilities, talks about the people working, it talks about 
information management, management talks about your document system and documents rolling around and us talks about continual quality improvement. And also specific to this is triage assessment and management and disposal of your patient when the patient lands into an emergency department, how you triage, how you assess and move forward. And then also emergency medical services, medication management and safety and then and hygiene and infection controls. In all it covers the organizational behavior, it covers organization structure, and it also captures the the clinical aspects of care to be delivered in the emergency department. So uh, because time is very, very limited, and so I try to pull up a couple of the standards to demonstrate that how this standard can help an emergency department in improvement and patient safety. So chapter one is governance and leadership, GAL, and there are six standards in GAL, so I'm not uh, going through the criteria in each of these standards but covering the, the, the standards only. So, so for example, uh, governance and leadership GL1 talks about the management of emergency department is committed to and actively engage in quality and safety. So it's about top management commitment uh, towards quality and safety in, in emergency department. And that's how it's trickled down the entire organization uh, from top to bottom, because the, if there is no commitment from top, it will not move. So first thing is, is the commitment from the management. And then it's about accountability. Who is accountable for quality and safety of care delivered? Obviously it's the management. And, but in, in order to become an accountable, they need to know what's going on uh, around. So for that, it is empowered to receive reports on quality and safety about the care being delivered in emergency department. So they get the report uh, on a regular basis about different aspects as defined in the standard or the organization may define their own uh, in addition uh, and then uh, send the report to the management. So looking at the report, they would know what's going on. And then linking accountability and responsibility of key leadership functions and, and, and assigned. So who is the director or CEO, who is the head of the department, who are the key people who makes decision about managerial and clinical functions. Uh, ED delivers services and makes decisions in accordance with institutional values and ethical principles. So it is says that you need to have your values defined. You need to have your ethical principles defined. And so it can be done in different manners. For example, you are part of a hospital, basically. So you may have a hospital-wide, um, you know, the, the values defined. So if you, you need to review them, and if you find that those values are pretty uh, common for your department, you can adopt as it is. But if you feel that you, you may need to develop some other values, which are more prominent and significant for your department, you may do so. Emergency department facility documents, it's operational and financial management. So it's about operational and financial management. There should be someone responsible for operational management, usually the chief executive officer, uh, um, or uh, of the hospital delegate this responsibility to the head of the department. Uh, and then the financial management. So it's also, um, uh, as I mentioned, because ED are based in a hospital. So you may really draw the functions from the main hospital functionalities, but also departmental wise. So you can have your own financial management to the tune you are uh, authorized to, to manage with the funds. Chapter two about design and facility management. So it's, it's about designing. It's about flow, flow operation in, a, in an emergency department. So first thing comes, is you should follow the applicable laws and regulation applicable. So when patient comes to you, whether it is medical legal or it is something else or, or any other law applies to you, you need to follow all those. Uh, there is a document of safety and security plan. So when you talk about a building, a physical infrastructure, the first thing come to mind is safety of the building itself. What about the security of, of that uh, premises? You know, Do you have a, a digital surveillance through video cameras? Do you have guards? What system security plan you have in place? Documented plan and system for management of hazardous materials. So it's like hazmats. Most of the hospitals do that follow that and make a list of and, and make sure that they do. So you similarly, uh, you have to have those. 
ED ensures the provision of potable water, electricity, and toilet facilities. So it's important. Uh, round the clock supply of potable water, electricity, and toilet facilities uh, for patients and visitors. There is a documented emergency response plan. So in case of any emergency or a disaster, whether it's a man-made or a natural, how you would respond? Do you have an emergency response plan or disaster response plan? You have to have. There is a documented biomedical equipment management program. So it's about biomedical equipment. So whatever equipment you have, this should be part of your hospital uh, equipment management plan, which include, uh, you know, annual maintenance contract, AIM, or preventive maintenance, calibration, and so on and so forth. ED has a program for medical cases, vacuum and compressed air, very, very important. Uh, all three component gases, vacuum and compressed air, you have to have a proper supply of of good quality, as well as a backup in case your main supply fails. So what a backup you have and how long you can survive in case you have cut off with the outer supply. So you, you need to define how much you have, how much you need a day, and then how, how much you should be keeping to survive for a few days. Uh, a risk management plan. Yes, you should have a risk management system, which is comprised of risk management policy, procedure, and a plan for risk management. A risk can be any, it can be clinical risk, it can be infrastructure risk, it can be business risk, it can be financial risk, it can be any type of risk. So you first list out potential risks to organization and then work around how you can mitigate those risks. Uh, and also uh, risk management in ambulance services. So ambulance services like uh, sometime integral part of hospital emergency system and sometime not if you are outsourcing, but you should have a risk management in MLS services when, how you get a breakdown, how you will manage and all sort of thing. The third chapter is about staffing and training uh, standards, basically it's about human resources, the people working in an emergency department. Is the facility has a documented process for human resource planning. So any HR department function starting from the planning because you need to know how many people you need what you need, you need doctor, nurse, paramedic, what you need, so how much, how many you need and what you need. So you define your requirement in terms of qualifications, experience and numbers, what you need. And so that's actually planning. Now, once you plan, then how you get them, how you get the numbers, how you get the types uh, you have planned. So you should have a, a, you know the things to do. And then once people come into, into the department, they are hired, then how, how you move their journey? They need to be provided with an orientation program or we call induction program to talk about the infrastructure, the facility, the policy, the procedures, and so on and so forth. And then they should also be having a continuous professional development program. They should also have a, a system of performance appraisal on a regular basis also to capture any grievance if any of the staff need to file any grievance. A policy for addressing health needs, and it's very, very important that you prefer people working in emergency department are addressed in a very, a very smooth and uh, strong manner to, to make sure that they remain safe at all time. So it may be related to any, any vaccination we they need to have because they are into frontline. Uh, any vaccination required for them, they need to be given any prophylaxis in case of any accident anything which they need to be uh, you know, <laughs> careful about, you should have a policy around it. A documented system of maintaining personal files for all the staff members. So as a record uh, in terms of what you have, how many you have, the individual should have a personal file containing the details of the bio data, the qualifications, experience, performance, appraisal, professional development, anything and everything starting from STS-1 to last everything will capture will capture in this in the file for individual staff chapter four is about information education and communication so in any organization including ed of a hospital important that how you what information you need how you get that from how you collect the information how you use it how you secure this information, how you store this information, how you disseminate this information, and how you discard it in, in case it is to be discarded. So everything should be there. So quarterly, yearly, quarterly or yearly training matrix to be framed as per the need of the department. Emergency department maintains a manual 
uh, uh, containing policies and standard of practice. Uh, all the verbal orders must be documented by the receiver with the order given, method of communication, data and time of call made, handover, which includes intra-departmental or inter-departmental um, uh, follow-up, both written and verbal orders. So if there is a transition of pa patient movement uh, within or outside department that should be recorded, and there must be effective communication system in place of ED for emergency inquiries and EMS calls. So anybody looking for an emergency service should be able to get to the department very quickly uh, through a dedicated number. So this is about you know how the things move in an emergency department. Um, do you have to have a policy and procedure? Well, when you can deliver things verbally, when you call them, when the doctors can advise nurse or nurse can advise, uh, call doctors to you know talk about the patient and receive instructions and orders from the doctor. So you, all these need to be really put around through policies and how you will execute them through procedures. Chapter five about documentation and information system uh, management is about what, what you collect in terms of a demographic a patient information. Uh, you may have a paper-based system, you may have a completely digital system, or you can have a, a combination of that. So it's entirely you, your facility, how you have it. Every page of the patient information sheet must have at least two patient identifiers. So basically we say patients should be uniquely identified so that it's not uh, you know, messed up with any other patient. So minimum two identifier, uh, uh, you know, <coughs> uh, one of them should be unique identity, which uh, hospitals generate for individual patients. Uh, all the cross references made from the ED must be documented, date and time of call, call made, by call made to, and the outcome of the call must be documented so that anybody looking at the case sheets, patient sheets records, this should be able to know what's going on. Institution must form a list of standard abbreviations which are permitted for clinical documentation. So as we call it, uh, first define if you are going to use any abbreviation, if yes, define which abbreviation you are gonna use and that, that they should be approved. So we call it approved list of standard abbreviation. If, if any abbreviation you which is not approved is not acceptable. There should be an effective mechanism to protect the patient related information from left or damage. So it's about safety and security of the information you collect for individual patients. Uh, you need not to divulge this information to anybody else other than patient or uh, asked by court of law. There must be a process in place in the laboratory services or radiology department means diagnostic, whether it's imaging or lab, to initiate the ED, uh, intimate the ED on an alarming report or findings during. So it's about the critical alert values. If a diagnostic lab or center comes to know certain uh, critical values of uh, critical results, they need to quickly inform the concerned person. ED must adhere to define retention policy, patient information. How long you will keep the records of the patient? It should be defined in law in terms of regulation. If any, if not, then you can define your own policy. Process must be in place for situations such as uh, failure, uh, non-accessibility of electronic information system, failure of downtime time, or electronic information system, immediate alternative pathways must be. So in case your server is down, in case your backup of power is down, or some, something happened, and you are not able to use a your, your electronic system. When, what you should be doing, you should have a backup plan. In case if something happened, then you are up with the manual system and provide the services continually. Uh, ED implements a robust document control system, very important. Document control means you know what document are available in, our documents are available in the emergency department for you. So the right document to the right person, available to the right person at the right time. Okay, right document available at the right person at the right place at the right time. Is that the definition that any document which is obsolete should not be available at the, at the workplace, it should be out. Chapter six about continual quality improvement. It's about defining your measures, defining your parameters and criteria or standards or you know, indicators to measure your improvement. So there is a structured quality improvement program. So you define your quality improvement program, what you want in your quality improvement program. You define, make it a structured process and then implement it. 
Similarly, you should have a documented uh, structured patient safety program. So uh, what you consider as a patient safety, it includes a, a, a correct identification of patient, correct medication, you know, correct procedure, no fall, no uh, near miss, no sentinel event, you know, injection safety, drug safety, um, surgical safety, all sort of things should be part of your patient safety program. Facility defines and monitor performance indicators. So really have open to the facility to define their own performance indicator on managerial indicator, on clinical indicator, turnaround of staff, turnaround of patients, staff satisfaction, patient satisfaction might be the managerial indicators. But what about clinical indicators, you know, uh, infection rates in ED, how identification process, you define your own uh, and then implement them, use them for further improvement and measurement. Chapter seven is triage assessment management and disposition attempt. It's about standard evidence-based triage criterion in place that as soon as patient arrives in ED, you should immediately use an evidence-based protocol for initiating the care. Emergency department patient assessment should follow stipulated timelines as per the triage category. So which category of triage you have put in the patient, whether it is, is red or pink or yellow, what, 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 what level you have assigned and, and depending on that, how you are offering care to them. All critically ill patients presenting to triage to be received, the necessary needed emergency resuscitation and stabilization. So you have to provide you know, resuscitation services and stabilization of patient till he finds the right way of moving forward. The facility identifies, documents, and protects the rights of patients supporting individual beliefs and, and values. So this is about the rights of the patient as well as responsibilities. And, you know, also linked with how, how the department, you know, um, lists them out, how they, the rights are communicated to patients and they, how, how they are respected. So you need to train your staff. You need to educate your staff about their rights and then, you know, um, uh, train them how they should be exercising uh, to implement these so that patient feel that yes, he is empowered and, and then they are protected. Uh, ED has documented policies and procedures for care of patients under special conditions, such as restraints, uh, it may be physical or chemical restraints, having a pain management system and end of life care. So emergency department is really crucial and it's very complex uh, within the hospital different types of patients walk in, different out patients having different outcomes. Somebody would be fit and fine after some time, some may not, right? So you have to really uh, be cautious of the situation in there and, and act accordingly. Chapter eight is about emergency medical services and uh, is, is again important because uh, the stronger your emergency medical services, the outcome are, would be fine. It would be better for your patients. So ED defines pre-hospital EMS clinical standards. So it's pre-hospital. It's not, you know, uh, within first they come. It is outside the hospital. You define those standards. And then you assure as a department um, safe operations and risk management. And these, again, when we talk about uh, different standards in different chapters, not necessarily they are in isolation. At times they may be in sync, they may be interrelated. Like we talked about uh, risk management in, in, in which chapter, the previous chapter related to the facility, facility and risk management. It again comes here, the risk both operation and you know um, to make sure the safety of the patient, safety of people within that, and then how you, you mitigate and manage those things. So it can, you, you can link those. And if you need to extrapolate, you can extrapolate as well. All equipment and facilities must be maintained to a high standard to assure the delivery of quality of care. So any equipment uh, you, you may have in, in your hospital, in emergency department, as well as in an ambulance, for example, you have an ambulance as well. You have to ensure that they are all, all time working. They are properly functioning. Train people and attend them. Train people are trained to use them, um, and so that their delivery is really nice in terms for patient care. There is an EMS communication center. So, 
what if patient needs or someone need to call to emergency department? What is the system to call? Is it an automated EVR system or is it a voice recorder system? What, what, what is the system you have? And does it really function when there is a need? Uh, the organization builds relations with community. It's very important that any healthcare organization or including ED, um, they should really speak to the community, the people they are serving around to understand their requirements. What they, they what do they need? And then accordingly start working around. It's not just, uh, you know, it's a random idea in the mind. Oh, we want to do this and we start doing without knowing what we are doing and what will be the pot pot potential outcome. No, we should have a complete a system of, uh, you know, um, engaging with the community. And sometimes community suggest, but based on the needs, you develop your services. Uh, you may find something very cool, maybe say stroke is a stroke prone region or is a hypertensive region or something. You, you, you people may end up in your ED with those symptoms. So you, you, you really should be able to pick up. You should be able to provide care to patients. So that's why it's, it's about engaging and building good relations with community. Documented procedure exists for the performance of various procedures. So this is about any procedure you perform, whether it's a clinical or non-clinical. So any procedure you perform, whether it is Resuscitation, or it is about any intubation or any any surgical procedure or any non-surgical procedure. You should have a procedure written uh, for that to perform. If you call the standard operating procedures, you should have. Chapter nine about medication safety and management. And it is recognized world over, particularly by World Health Organization, that out of um, several hundred thousand medication errors happening around the world, a uh, most significant cat contributor to that is the medication errors. So medication errors are a major chunk of medical errors happening around the globe. And while realizing that medication errors are a global challenge for patient safety, the last year WHO has announced medication without harm as a third global patient safety challenge. The first global patient safety challenge was uh, clean care, safe care means hand hygiene, and then use of checklists. Um, use of checklists, we call it sur safe surgery checklist of WHO. So safe surgery saves life. That was the theme, safe surgery safe life, clean care, has safer care about hand hygiene. And now the third uh, global patient safety challenge is, is, is medication safety. It is about uh, medication, the theme is medication without harm. And it says, no check ask is for both patient and the doctor no check ask means both doctor and patient should know what medicine uh, the doctor is prescribing and patient what medicine he is taking no check before you prescribe or after prescribe you check whether that's appropriate medicine you are prescribing and similarly for patient they need to check what doctor is actually you know written and they have the same medicine it's no check and ask in case uh, you don't uh, uh, get in conf uh, confidence, you ask doctor, you ask patient. So it's about no check, ask for both uh, doctors and patients. Uh, so that's the importance of medication safety. And this, this chapter is dedicated to that, uh, having a documented policy and procedure uh, existing for management of medication. Uh, so you write your, your policy procedure for how you are going to manage your um, uh, medication system. Uh, process for procurement of medication that in case you need to procure, uh, what this process you will be used for um, in a procurement, uh, criteria for a procurement, quality of medicine and so on and so forth. Policy procedure for prescription and, and prescription is one of the uh, challenge and uh, there are a lot of prescription errors also happen. So you should have a policy around to, pre to prescribe medicine, what medicine, how uh, the mode of prescription and et cetera, et cetera, you know, uh, how to write legible and all those things. Policy and procedure for safe dispensing of medication. So after prescription and dispensing from the pharmacy or drugstore that, that they should be properly dispensed. And then for administration. So prescription, dispensing and administration, three stages of medicine uh, reaching to the patient. An error may happen at any three of stairs. So if you are careful, you can stop error at any of these three before it's harm patient. Facility has a system of monitoring of adverse drug event, uh, ADRs, 
uh, ADEs and uh, policies, a procedure for use of narcotic drugs and, and psychotropic substances. So if you are using a narcotics and psychotropic, you should be licensed under NDPS Act, and then you should have a should follow rule of a double lock and key and safety and security, and also use under high risk uh, category of medical medication. Documented policies and procedures guide the use of medical supplies um, and consumables. So it's about you know um, other than medication, the supplies and consumables, how you how you how you how you board them, how you prescribe. I mean, how you write a policy around getting the good quality of consumables and also and also the uses. Uh, chapter 10 is about hygiene and infection control. Again, it's a hospital-wide requirement and emergency department is not excluded. So it's a very, 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 very critical um, area that how we ensure a good hygiene and infection-free, uh, at least uh, risk-free for inf infection. So we have to have a comprehensive hygiene and infection control program, which captures your policy, your procedure, and how you're going to work around. Uh, a documented process to ensure infection control in sterilization units. So your CSSD basically, uh, sterilization unit, you have to have a strong process and policies and procedures around making sure that anything goes into and come out is really ensuring you that they are really sterile and they can be used without any problem. Facility has a documented policy on biomedical waste segregation disposal. So again, it's a regulation, biomedical waste handling rules and regulation. You have to segregate at source in different color-coded bins and depending on the risk and type of waste you are handling and then proper storage and then proper disposal. Facility has a system of use of personal protective equipment, PPEs. And of course, after COVID, everybody knows how to use them and which PPE should be used and when it should be used. And, and, and it is very important for staff working there. Facility has a policy to prevent or reduce hospital associated infection. So you should be working towards uh, zero infection, uh, but if you can't then at least how you reduce that, if you can't achieve zero, but how you reduce it and has a policy and procedure for general cleaning and disinfection. So general housekeeping, cleaning of department equipment and, 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 the, and the things there, and also uh, dis disinfecting some of the areas before they are being used. So this is about a uh, whole of uh, you know, infection prevention and control program in the organization uh, specific to uh, emergency department so that uh, the patient doesn't get affected by this. Uh, they should only get the treatment and they should not get any burden of infection out of the hospital because they are there in the hospital. So this, this complete the standard. And uh, this is quickly, I think the last slide about the process uh, very important from the perspective of the users. So any emergency department of the hospital interested uh, to go for accreditation uh, is good for them to understand the process. Parent, uh, process is very transparent, very laid out, uh, simple to understand. Uh, it's based on self-assessment. Self-assessment is basically um, uh, you do your own check where you are in, in relation to the standard. So self-assessment toolkit is based on the standards for accreditation. So you, 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 can, you can request a self-assessment toolkit from QI Secretariat by sending an email request. We would be happy to send that uh, to you. So you look at it and then do what you have. So it can help you bringing out a gap and a sort of a gap analysis in the beginning. And then over a period of time, as you implement more and more standards based on the gaps, you can extend them. So once you are happy and you meet the scoring requirement as we defined, you can apply in an application form along with the self-assessment toolkit and also associated document which you refer into the self-assessment toolkit, NFEs, which is defined and which is very nominal, you know, to encourage the participation of more and more emergency departments. Then we at the secretariat review it and then register the, the, the entity and then sell the cell and the acknowledgement. If there are any gaps identified during application review, we let the hospital knows and then they can they send the information back to us. Once that is done, we appoint a team uh, for assessment. Uh, they do the document review uh, to understand what documentation they have. In case there is a gap, they can be informed before the team arrives uh, for the assessment. So there is assessment. Of course, it was an on-site assessment, but because of COVID, we moved to virtual and uh, hybrid uh, assessment as well. But in normal circumstances, standard is, a, is, a, is an on-site assessment by a team of expert, depending on the number of and the beds you have in, in, in the hospital. Then uh, 
Once that is done, a report is generated by the assessment team and is sent to the secretariat. We review the report. And if there are any gaps, any non-compliances, then the department is requested to take the corrective action within 90 days. And they submit the action plan and corrective action uh, to us. And we get it reviewed by the assessment team. And once they accept it, we take it to the accreditation committee. So accreditation committee review the report, their corrective action, their legal requirements, statutory requirements, and the scoring, whether they meet the minimum scoring requirements. And based on that, they recommend to the board for accreditation or otherwise. So that's, once it is recommended for accreditation, it is, uh, it is, uh, the accreditation is granted by the board. It's valid for three years. And then there is a surveillance assessment somewhere between middle of the cycle, if it be 15 to 18 months of accreditation. And then six months before the expiry, the department applies again for the renewal uh, for accreditation. So this is the whole process of accreditation for an emergency department. Uh, so with this, I, I hang my uh, presentation. Thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity. And I think we have good time for any questions if any of the participants might have. Thank you very much. Over to you, Savannah. Thank you. So thank you so much for taking us through the current standards, in fact, the chapters on how the current QA standards for ED is laid out and all the details of those chapters as well in a, in a very brief context. Thank you so much for it. Uh, we will take some questions, but before that, uh, I have a question for you. Sir, clearly there are a lot of young emergency medicine doctors are doing a wonderful job across the country are attending this program and they will also see this live uh, in the next few coming days. If we have to ask you as an expert in quality and somebody uh, who has reached perhaps the top leadership level of quality, what is your advice for all those young emergency medicine doctors who are leading their department today excellently in terms of clinical aspects, but what they should do to ensure their patients are safer? And how do they make their departments or how do they build a culture of quality within their departments? Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, very, very important question uh, for anybody working in the emergency department, particularly the leaders who are heading the department of a hospital. See, uh, there are two situations. Many hospitals are, are already accredited by whether NABH, QAI, JCI, or any accreditation body. So the accreditation standard for hospital cover everything in the hospital. but they may not cover each department and specialty in detail. And that's why the, the importance of specialized uh, standards become more and more prominent. Um, as you all, uh, you yourself know how, how much effort you have put in for, for your own department uh, for getting these standards up for accreditation. So it really helps uh, the people working in there to really in, understand in depth that what they really need to have in the emergency department as far as quality and patient safety is concerned. So my advice to all these young leaders uh, or heading uh, the emergency department is to get a copy of accreditation standards. I'm not saying that they should immediately go for accreditation. First, they should get a copy of accreditation standard from us, then start using it, implementing it in their in, in department. And over a period of time, they would themselves will feel that they have improved. Either it's in terms of physical infrastructure, in terms of physical, or in terms of managerial process, or in terms of any clinical process and out. They should start monitoring those things, you know. So they themselves will believe, yes, this really helps. It means the standard is making a difference in improving quality and patient safety. One day they will feel, okay, everything is there now. Can we can go for accreditation? They can go for, they can apply, they will get accreditation. But what happens usually, it happens the other way around, you know. People want to see a certificate first rather than implementing the standard. That makes life difficult because somebody may help you in preparing some documentation and implementation, but you may not be able to demonstrate your commitment, the real practice of the standard in the entire, in the entire department. That will only come when you as a leader will take it on your, your shoulders. Like a hospital CEO or director taking the entire responsibility of the hospital, you consider that in his place or her place, that you are the head of the emergency department. Now it's your responsibility to run this department in a manner the CEO is running the hospital. Whether it is financial, whether it is you know uh, clinical, it can be anything means as a leader. And standard definitely helps in achieving and materializing these goals for you. You need not to go anywhere else to, to get advice. 
you just follow the standards and you will be through second thing as i mentioned the standards are not static they are they should be changed and evolve over a period of time through a system of feedback from the users of the standard so you as a leader also have an opportunity to give feedback to us as qai in suggesting some changes in the standard itself where it changes may be related to some additional requirements to put in maybe some modification in the standard some maybe deletion addition deletion modification anything they can suggest because standards were written uh, there but it, it, the user should tell us that oh no we don't find this useful why not we use this in different manner so you have an opportunity to contribute to the development and refinement of the standard also so my my suggestion to all the leaders in the emergency department of the hospital is to start using the standard and that will itself guide you how you to train people whom you have to trail what system you have to put in place some documents you already have if you are an accredited you can use them you need not to develop everything again you can use the hospital wide policies if they fit into your into your domain so this is this is what i would like to say for all ed leaders to start implementing the standards sir thank you so much i think that's a very valid and a fantastic advice accreditation can come on time but there is an intent to improve the quality is what is most important and for that um, so i I'm, i'm sure you are happy to share those standards and in fact i am more than happy to get it from qa and to pass it on to all our member base through our newsletter or maybe as a special mail uh so that like everybody first gets an access to the standards and our request and hope is to start implementing these first right so certifications can come later and that's all voluntary but at least start implementing this and focus on this so very very right and i think uh, qi would be happy to give a complimentary pdf copy to all your uh, members so we'll share with you and then you can share across with all your members <laughs> thank you so much sir i think we got a couple of comments uh, one is about our checklist and ed standards uh, indicator for implementation of ed standards and uh, i think it's a couple of thank you messages but uh, navin is there any question specifically uh no nothing in qa session okay more of comments and thank you there uh, so anybody can send an email uh, to you know uh, to shakshi uh, i think s a k s h i shakshi at q a i dot o r g dot in and uh, or you can request savana or sami if, uh, that uh, you need a copy we would be happy to share and then distribute it across yeah uh, sir what i would request is uh, i will write to you and perhaps take that copy from you and we will circulate it to our member base definitely uh, to our that would be nice that would be nice so thank you so much for your valuable time today and it's a real pleasure having you it's always a pleasure interacting with you and to learn uh, from you so thanks for spending your time today with us no thank you so much sarna thanks you sami thank you uh, you know uh, yashoda group of hospital and you know all uh, navin and you know srinath and team entire team uh, making it happen it's, it's really needed it's really needed you know creating awareness is very very important uh, for Uh, patient safety uh thank you sir navin over to you